The tricky thing about this song though is this isn't something that you'd realize or even notice just listening to the song driving down the road. What makes a bad worship song? I think most of us have heard of bad worship songs or like bad theology in the songs. My brothers, Alan Parr, Mike Winger, Ruslan, many others have done songs critiquing the theology of Bethel or Hillsong lyrics. Today, I don't wanna focus on critiquing, but I wanna look at the top 10 songs that I can find on iTunes and just on the internet of like what people are listening to today. Hopefully I've heard of some of them. <laughs> and we can evaluate the theology and see what are they actually communicating to us? Because we might have a general idea of what the song says. You know, if you're anything like me, you yearn for more in your publicities. You don't just want surface level cultural Christianity. You wanna go deeper in the word. You wanna truly know the Lord and his word to have that rich faith life with mission, purpose, value, calling all from the Lord and his word. And that is what we pursue here at How to Faith the Life, to go deeper, to ask the hard questions, to really look and evaluate. So I don't wanna be overly critical in this video, but I have been learning a little bit more, which would push against maybe some of my closed-minded thoughts about worship music that I would have had even just last month. So all that to say, stay until the end where we're gonna make a playlist of worship songs for my husband to play next week while he drives down to Florida with the youth. First off, the very first song that I could find here on the interwebs of like songs that people are playing, I found it on iTunes and on the internet's top worship songs of 2020 from praisecharts.com is House of the Lord by Phil Wickham. Didn't know Phil Wickham was still making music, good for him. He was cool when I was in high school. I recognize this album cover. Phil. I'm gonna play a second of it so we all know what we're talking about here. We worship the God who was, who is, who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors. He parted the raging sea. My God, he holds a victory. Those are the open lines. Proclaiming who God is and what he has done. Very biblical. And worshiping based on that, we see that all throughout the Psalms. Great, great theology. Now, let's grab the Bible dictionary. What is house of the Lord? Household, house top. I don't have house of the Lord. House of God. Common phrase used in the ancient Near Eastern world for structure used to accommodate a deity or his servants. So you wanna think of like a pagan temple or God's temple. In the Old Testament, it referred to the tabernacle, Solomon's temple, national shrines or pagan temples. In the New Testament times, the Old Testament custom of referring to the temple as the house of God was still employed, but with some significant changes after Christ's ascension, the church viewed itself as the house of God. No longer dwelt in buildings made by human hands, but in the lives of those who confess Jesus as Lord. House of the Lord, therefore, isn't just the church, but rather house of the Lord is even in the heart of me because the spirit lives within me. I would rate the song like an eight out of 10. Just looking up the truth of what house of the Lord was took it to a whole new level. Next up is Fill My Cup Up by Andrew Rip. I've been high, I've been low, I've been this is also something I've heard on Caleb. Fill my cup up. Oh. Let's see the lyrics though. I've been walking to a city I cannot see. Ooh, ooh. To the depths of the valley where the sun can't reach. Ooh, ooh. I've been high, I've been low, I've been looking for the river that can fill my soul. Been walking to a city I cannot see. We're given the picture of searching for more. Like I opened up this video, I talked about how we yearn for more in our Bible studies. We don't just want cultural Christianity, that country club church lifestyle. We want the Lord to change our lives, change everything about our broken selves because we know we bring nothing good to the table. Crying out to the Lord to fill our cup. Now fill my cup, that phrase comes from, I assume the idea of Psalm 23. Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Going back to the idea I've looked all over, this is what I want, is the Lord. I'm assuming this idea of fill up my cup, Lord, crying out to the Lord to fill our cups, comes from this phrase, my cup overflows, this promise of what we have in the Lord, and crying out based on scripture, hey, you say you can fill me up, do that, Lord. That's a biblical thing, that's very David. Let's look though more at the lyrics. I was born far from home, but I've been thriving in the wonder of the great unknown because I'm drinking from a well from another place. Ooh, that brings in John 4, woman at the well, water that never runs dry kind of thing, never thirsty again kind of idea, love it. Cross reference even in your worship songs, y'all. Yeah, I don't see anything wrong with this. Um, previously, like getting my biblical education, I had many professors, biblical teachers tell me like, hey, it's not really good that these days Christian music kind of is very so me-centered. Fill up my cup, fill up my cup. Oh, how he loves us, oh, how he loves us. Very like us-centered. And I recently was reading Scott McKnight's book, The Blue Parakeet, which really pushed some of my buttons in a good way. He made the point that if we don't use this me-centered language, which 
which we do see in the Psalms, we're not personalizing our faith and taking on our faith and owning our faith in that personal relationship, which we're called to do. And it really kind of made me think twice about worship language. Maybe it's not always bad when we do use me-centered language. Not is it just, oh, how he loves me. Oh, how he loves me. Oh, how he loves me. But I'm crying out for you to fill up my cup, Lord. Surrendered, dependent mentality that points to this idea of a savior and that we need him and not ourselves. I'm not going to take fault with it. So nine out of 10. The next one is Charity Gales. Thank you, Jesus, for the blood. Thank you. Jesus. I'm gonna be honest with y'all, never heard this song before. I was a wretch, I remember who I was, I was lost, I was blind, I was running out of time. Sounds very much like Amazing Grace lyrics. Sin separated, the breach was far too wide, but from far side of the chasm, you held me in your sight. That's a very biblical understanding of like, it's not just like I'm a little bit of a sinner, the breach was far too wide, you held me in your sight. So you made a way across the great divide, left behind heaven's throne to build it here inside left behind heaven's throne, so incarnation, to build it here inside. I'm gonna be honest with you, I don't know if I love, I know that rhymes, I know it works, but I don't know if he's building heaven's throne in our hearts. Because the throne in scripture is the judgment seat. The throne, like the heavenly deliberations, the judgment, it doesn't go on in our hearts. But we have the Holy Spirit in our hearts. The scripture doesn't really talk about the Holy Spirit sitting on a throne though. I don't know. Hey, future faith. I realized later, I think the lyrics mean like sitting on the throne of my life. I think that's what it is. But still, it's not the heavenly throne, but we get what the lyrics intend. It's just not like quite exact. But if you're looking for the rhyme, I don't know. Leave your thoughts down in the comments below. Is this something to nitpick? pick over. I don't really know if it is. I took my place, laid inside my tomb of sin. I took my place, you know, substitution. I just never heard it word that way. So I'm trying to think that's not, yeah. One part of this is like, it's basically taking amazing grace and just rewording parts of it. The other parts of it, there's a few phraseology that might be, if you really want to get super critical, maybe it could be better slightly wordier or differently. It's a new way to describe the gospel to say, laid inside my tomb of sin. I don't think I have a problem with that. What was the other problematic phrase? You held me in your sight. I would say, I can't really get out of his sight, but it rhymes. I don't know. I'd say like seven out of 10, like it's fine. There's just a few phrases I'm like, meh, meh. I think the next song is actually from her too. Yep, I Speak Jesus. Is that, I speak the name of Jesus. I can go hard on that song when that comes on the radio, okay. Break every stronghold. Not that song. Don't know the song, let's see. I just wanna speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind. Cool, great, do it. Cause I know that there's peace within your presence. I speak Jesus. I just wanna speak the name of Jesus till every dark addiction starts to break. Yeah, declaring that there's hope and there's freedom. I speak Jesus. So this is seeming like it's a song of redemption, healing, freedom over new believers as an evangelism tool, something like that. Shout Jesus from the mountains, Jesus in the streets, Jesus in the, yeah, cool. Great song, solid scriptural references and truth of what Jesus does for us. Super good worship song to surround yourself with other believers. The music video that I just watched had other believers singing together and like beautiful songs. Sunday Sermons by Ann Wilson. Let's check it out. Oh, oh I know this one. Devil's gonna try and take me out of that church, but you can't take the church out of me. Huh. We're getting a little critical here. I wish it was a little bit more based on the work of Jesus rather than, I grew up in the church and those Sunday sermons are deep planted within my heart. Like that's good. Wish it went back to more of the truth of Christ. I mean, she does say, and how much he loves me. I would always love, even just for like cultural Christianity songs like this one, to go a little bit deeper into the truth of the gospel, but that doesn't mean that we can't listen to the song. The devil's gonna try and take me out of that church, but you can't take the church out of me. Uh. What does it mean that you can't take the church out of me? As Christians, when we talk about the faith, when you say the enemy can't take the church out of me, what does that mean? Because we are the church. What does that mean? Because it's not like we put ourselves into the church or we earned any part of our salvation. It seems in this song, as much as I love this song and I can, you know, drive down the road to this song, it's not really describing a saving Ooh, I hesitate, I cringe to say this. No one can come to the faith from hearing that song, I would say. They might, a seem might be planted of like, okay, oh, he loves me. Oh, something's going on in that church. But this doesn't bring someone to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And that's not the job of this song, I don't think. Wish it was a little bit more theologically deep, but it's like a country pop Christianese music. What are you gonna ask? Ann Wilson, rock on, present the gospel next time, but you're cool. Same God by Elevation Worship. 
Elevation worship, same God, oh goodness. The reason why I'm being dramatic and silly here is because not everyone is a big fan of Elevation, Hillsong, Bethel, all those bigger church-related bands because of the churches behind them. And I don't want to get political and like discuss like, should we listen to music from Hillsong even though Hillsong Church has gone, like it's become so public what Hillsong has gone through. Like, do we still support and listen to music? I would say, I think these are good questions for us to ask. We want to be responsibly consuming music. I think the Lord can still use Hillsong. If he can still use me, he can still use Hillsong Church once he has dealt with the brokenness. I have hope that because Hillsong has so many gifted songwriters and music production people, I have hope that their production or whatever can be redeemed. We need to have that kind of mindset. Like, yes, it's important to be like, doesn't seem to line up with scripture there, but to be able to take it down or correct ourselves or whatever necessary to give room for grace because that is the basics of our faith. So all that to say, let's see about this Elevation Worship song. How I need you now. Right off the bat, I heard a lot of statements about who God is. Good, that is the essence of worship. I'm calling on the God of Jacob. Cool, love it. I'm calling on the God of Moses, the one who opened up the ocean. I need you now to do the same thing for me, for me, for me. Mm, but you aren't David. If y'all are a big fan of Matt Chandler, you'll already recognize that reference. But basically, I'm not a big fan of that hermeneutic. When we come into scripture, identifying with the hero in the story and saying, oh yeah, this is my situation. Do what you did for Moses because it wasn't about Moses. It wasn't about him raising the staff and God parting the sea. It was about God redeeming his people for his glory from slavery and how that points to our salvation bought for us through Jesus on the cross. And just like he redeemed them from the slavery in Egypt, he does that to the slavery of our sin. Galatians 4 and 5 talk about this. So I would be a little bit hesitant to just like sing out, you did this for Moses, do this for me. Because one, he didn't just do it for Moses. Actually, he did it for the Israelites. That's a little bit of me-centered theology, which I was hoping that they wouldn't do because when I listened to it, they were singing truths about God. So maybe it gets better. I'm calling on the God of Mary, whose favor rests upon the lowly. You don't see this very often in Protestant churches. Okay. I'm calling on the God of David who made a shepherd boy courageous. I may not face Goliath, but I've got my own giants. It's just not the way that you want to approach the scriptures is seeing the main character and identifying yourself with them. Because if you were in that instance, you would have been his brothers, shaking in their boots, hiding in the tent. You wouldn't have faced Goliath. David, he's a picture of Jesus facing the sin Goliath. The hermeneutical problem here is when we identify ourselves with the heroine as a high view of self and a low view of God's work, we don't save ourselves. It is all by Christ's blood and work on the cross. It is all by God's mercy. It's not of David being being brave enough to face Goliath. So therefore God was able to redeem his people for his glory. That's not the story of the gospel. But I don't wanna say like this song is all bad because there were points where they're like, God, I need you and this is who you are. If I'm gonna be completely honest with you, I wouldn't promote this song. I wouldn't say like, yeah, this is the rock star song. Go listen to it. If my church decided to sing this song in our worship service, I would be like, wow, we're getting fancy with contemporary music. And I would be a little bit bummed out that they chose this song. So whatever that means, I'm giving it like a four because of the hermeneutical issue that I have with approaching the scriptures. But there's still four points out of the 10 there because there's little bits of biblical truth, but I think there were better worship songs out there. I hate being like, ugh, critical. Goodness of God, Bethel music. Goodness of God. Okay, we all know the song. Bum, 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 bum. Your goodness is running after me. Yes, I like that. I love that because I'm not running after God. If left into myself, I would not do that. None of us would do that. We'd be running after our own pleasures. With my life laid down, I'm surrendered now. I give you everything. Love that. There is still a lot of me-centered language where we could better make it just about God. Instead of saying, I'm gonna sing about the goodness of God, we could just sing about the goodness of God or command that we sing about the goodness of God. And that's the Psalms. Often these congregational responses, let's sing about the goodness of God. He just redeemed us from blah, blah, blah. And then they're like, yes. And they all join in and you, you, know, you see the congregation join in and they sing back the truths. I would prefer that kind of style in our worship songs rather than just over and over again. I'm gonna sing, I'm gonna sing. Cause that does exist exemplify this. Look at me, I'm singing about the goodness of God, therefore I must be good and holy and awesome. There is an implied command or encouragement to join in on this worship of God. I don't know, I don't wanna to be too critical either. So eight out of 10, seven out of 10, we're good. Rock on, going on the playlist. The other one, same God by Elevation Church, probably not, but goodness of God definitely going on the playlist for the youth group. Number seven, what he's done by passion. Have I heard this song before? What he's done, passion. 
Oh yeah, I've heard this. Get it! Man, she's got a powerful voice. It gave me like instant chills. Sounds like we're singing about the work of God and who he is and responding in worship. The heart of what worship is. Starts out with the hill of Calvary. Great. I save your blood for me. Doesn't get better than that for a worship song. Jesus set me free. We're on a great start. Ooh, I like that phrase. Even death is dead and done. I love the punniness of it. His life has overcome. Speak, say Oh, they're doing the command thing that the Psalms exemplify. They're telling the audience or they're telling the listener of the song, speak, say the name above all the names. Love it, love that. I would say 10 out of 10, mainly because they did the call and response idea in the song. Very biblical and I wish that we did it more. That is definitely going on the youth playlist. I also think that they would love that first one, that House of the Lord, Phil Wickham. Let's put that on the playlist. They're gonna be jamming out in that dorky church bus on their way. <laughs> we love our church bus. It is really cute. And it reminds me of when I was in youth group. I don't know if y'all are like me, but I grew up in church and those little church buses, like I would get so car sick, but so many good memories were made in like the minivans of parents in our youth group and on church buses. <sighs> Good times. Let's definitely include all the top rated songs. So like the eights and the nines, let's include, I think this Katie Nicole song is what I think it is. And we've got a really good playlist going, but let's see about this Katie Nicole song. In Jesus's name. Oh, 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 Katie Nicole. And maybe this is the song. Jesus name. If this is the song I'm thinking of, I think she's like literally a TikToker that sang this and then got like a record deal. I really hope this is a song because I like it. So this is it. Her name's Katie Nicole. Okay, I need to remember that. From what I've heard just listening to on the radio, whew, powerful lyrics. I speak the name of Jesus over you. In your hurting, in your sorrow, I will ask my God to move. I speak the name, all that I can do. In desperation, I'll seek heaven and pray this for you. So this idea of interceding for our brothers and sisters in the faith, petitioning the throne room of God in the name of Jesus, where scripture tells us the name of Jesus is very powerful. So this makes me think I got many questions recently about praying in the will of God. And I think this gives us a really good tension here of we're speaking the name of Jesus, petitioning the throne room for healing of authority, declaring blessings. We're called to petition the throne room of God. And she does a really good job of showing what it looks like on behalf of our brothers and sisters to bear each other's burdens and to petition God for that, even though we don't know if it is what's gonna happen and what is God's will, healing on this side of earth or in heaven. Love the concept, love the idea. I don't see anything that could be problematic unless you just overly read into it. But if you guys wanna watch the video where I talk a little bit more about like how do you know if it's God's will and what to pray and how to pray it, check out this video right here and I will see you guys in this video where Joe and I answer a lot of juicy questions, especially praying in God's will. See you guys in this video, bye guys.